Good morning and welcome, First Presbyterian Church. If you're a guest with us this morning, we are delighted that you're here to worship our great God and King and the Lord Jesus Christ. I do have one announcement. So there are a host of wonderful opportunities and announcements that I'll draw your attention to the insert. But I want to raise one for you next week at 5 o'clock p.m. in Murphy Hall on Sunday afternoon. We'll have a discussion on our gospel priorities that we just finished during the month of January. It'd be an opportunity to come and give us some feedback, your opinion, and also to hear the kinds of goals and aspirations that we had following and entering into gospel priorities. So if you're able to make that event next week, we'd love to have you. If you were unable to be here for our joint Sunday school class and hear about the priorities for 2019, that will be posted, that video will be posted on our website this week, and you can check that out there. The second verse of the hymn of our meditation this morning reads this way. Lord, now indeed I find thy power and thine alone can change the leper's spots and melt the heart of stone. As you prepare your heart, and as I prepare my heart for worship this morning, and ask God to melt our hearts of stone that we might worship him in spirit and in truth. Let's do that now. Stand. It is the voice of Jesus that invites us into worship, what he's done and what he promises to do through us. We respond. Come, let us return to the Lord. He will revive us. He will restore us that we may live in his presence. Let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to know him. As surely as the sun rises, he will appear. He will come to us like the winter rains like the Spirit waters the earth. The Lord be with you, with your spirit. Let us worship God.
you join me as we pray this morning? Apostle Paul says in God's word in Philippians, Worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Jesus Christ, and put no confidence in the flesh. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of corporate worship. Thank you for the joy of gathering with sisters and brothers to celebrate who you are and every good thing you've given us in Christ. May we offer you the worship you deserve in which you delight and for which we were designed. We abandon our worship personal agendas, Father. It's all about you, the Lord Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Would you please remind us of that this morning? Consume us afresh, humble us again, and liberate us for your praise. As you grant us a fresh awareness of your holiness and grace, we will seek to declare your worth with our minds, our hearts, and our bodies. Inform us, inflame us, renew us. Pour out your Spirit on us, Father. Our worship is vain apart from the Spirit's work and presence. We don't want to give you mere lip worship empty ritual, or rote liturgy. Free us to glory in Jesus Christ, to boast, to rejoice, and rest in everything Jesus has done for us. Turn our theology into doxology, our singing into adoration, and our learning into servanthood. May our worship be a sweet aroma to you and a transforming power for us. Send us forth with your benediction into a week of living and loving to your glory. So we pray in Jesus' exalted and loving name and God's people said, Amen. Our confession of faith this morning can be found in the words of the Nicene Creed. Christian, what do you believe? We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible. And we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We not only confess Jesus as our great high priest and king, but also as our savior. And as our savior, he has given his life to forgive us of our sins and make us right before his father, our God. If you're able now, would you kneel for a time of personal confession? Join me in singing our corporate confession.
this assurance of God's pardoning grace. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. In that great confidence, would you stand as we continue to worship? Continue with me in prayer. Your word says, God is light and in him there's no darkness at all. Walk in the light as he is in the light. And the blood of Jesus, his son, will cleanse you from all sin. Father, we're here to walk in the light. We want our hearts to be filled with the passion of your light and love. We know, Lord, all too often our hearts are dull. All too often our hearts are distracted. Father, prone to wander. Lord, we feel it. Prone to leave. The God who loves us. Lord, inflame our hearts for love. Teach us how to respond properly to what Christ has done for us. And teach us how to live by faith in the promise of what Christ will do on our behalf. That we can live in hope as we think about the challenges of our lives because Jesus loves us. Lord, we thank you for this church and we thank you for the leadership here that serves and advances your work. We pray for the youth staff. We pray that you would strengthen DT and Kelly House as they lead. We pray for John Mashenko and Natalie Cook as they serve and Karen Chrysler and Sarah Boudet. Thank you for the youth of this church that are scattered in schools throughout this city, middle school and high schoolers. Thank you, Father, for the light that they bring to their friends, the hope that they offer to a broken world. Use our youth in middle school and high school. Use our youth ministry. Strengthen them. Make them a light to this city, we pray. We thank you for Heritage Academy. And we pray for that light to continue to burn bright. We pray for their open house this week. We thank you for Dr. Linda Tucheron, Jan Hitchcock, and others, Beth Westergreen, who lead and serve there at Heritage Academy. Continue to make that ministry a light. We thank you, Father, for our missionaries, all of our missionaries. We pray especially now for a missionary in Asia that we can't mention their names for fear of harm, persecution. So we pray for their protection and for their ministry. 
We pray for these new believers who've come to faith. Strengthen these new believers. Also strengthen the new friends that are joining this weekly study. And that the gospel would go forth strongly in this hostile place. We thank you and praise you for uh, the deliverance of Jude Scarborough, the difficulty that he was facing with breathing. We thank you for Ricky and Charles, and even that Ricky's with us this uh, weekend. We pray for continued healing for little Jude. We thank you for the mission of Medical Campus Outreach in Cusco. We thank you for this family of our church. We pray that you would strengthen them. Others that are facing sadness and sickness, we pray that you would strengthen them as well. For Ben Munns, as he faces a very dire diagnosis and is struggling physically, we pray for Betty and Ed. We continue to pray for others that are battling illness and cancer. Thank you for the promise of your nearness. Thank you for the hope of your triumph. We continue to pray for the persecuted church. Today is around the world they might know the light and hope in the gospel. We use the words that you taught your disciples to pray as we seek to be your disciples. We use those words as we pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. Peace of the Lord be always with you. Share that peace with one another.
As you make your way back to your seats, we'll continue our worship. be seated. Please turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 12. Wasn't it great to have Perry Baranowski back with us? We welcome you back home, Perry. But yes, yes. Thank you. for And Sherry, kids, we're glad to see y'all. The Pass of Peace is an encouragement to me, too. I want you to know one of our members grabbed me around the shoulder and said, Pastor, I want you to know this. Jesus loves you, and so do we. And I said, tell me that after the sermon, too. Okay. <laughs> what a reminder that we belong to Jesus. And we'll be worshiping Jesus not just this morning, but tonight. We'll be worshiping Jesus as we've done almost every Sunday night for 215 years. Come join us. Uh, Kirk Sowers will be leading us in worship. John Frank's preaching. We return now to the book of Luke. I did enjoy our time in the Psalms during Advent and our Gospel Priorities Month. But our practice, if you're new here, is that we just turn the page and we allow the text to guide our thinking. And we're at Luke chapter 12. It's hard to believe this is the third calendar year where we've been studying Luke. But as we re-enter Luke, I want to make us aware that our topic today is judgment. Judgment at times can be a hard and difficult thing to understand and definitely a hard issue to deal with emotionally. If you're here this morning and you're skeptical, the topic of judgment may be difficult for you. You may have an aversion to trust. You may see evil around you and you may wonder, how can you trust a loving God when so much brokenness and evil is happening in the world? You're skeptical. I see that. You may be wounded. You may have experienced so much pain, you're asking a different question. God, how could you let this happen to me? And now I'm afraid to trust. Well, whether you're a skeptic or you know a skeptic, whether you're wounded or you know a wounded, 
Judgment is gospel's good news to us. And we'll see this in the passage this morning, that we don't have to be afraid to trust. Now, it is true that religion may let you down. People may let you down. But Jesus will never let you down. So to the skeptic and to the wounded, I offer this the hope of God's glorious gospel and judgment. Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 35. Be dressed ready for service and keep your lamps burning like men waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. I tell you the truth, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the second or third watch of the night. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left, he would not let his house be broken into. You also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Peter asked, Lord, are you telling this parable to us? or to everyone else. The Lord answered, who then is the faithful and wise manager whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. I tell you the truth, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose the servant says to himself, my master's taking a long time in coming. And then he begins to beat the men servants and maid servants and eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him. And in an hour he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. That servant who knows his master's will and does not get ready or does not do what his master wants will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much will be asked. I have come to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled, said Jesus. But I have a baptism to undergo. And how distressed I am until it is completed. Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, I came to bring division. From now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other. Three against two and two against three. They will be divided father against son and son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. This is the word of God. Thanks be to you, O oh God. Let's pray together. Jesus, these words are words of healing, but they're hard words. We need your spirit to teach us. We need you to help us to understand the healing power of your justice and your love. If there's anyone here today that doesn't know for sure that if they were to die tonight, that they would be in heaven with you. Would you work a miracle and draw their hearts to you? Remind us, those who have been converted, what it means to be belonging to your fellowship, fellowship of your burning heart. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Chuck Colson in his book, Be the Body, tells the story of a small Romanian church in the 1980s. This church was operating in and under the cruel leadership of the communist leader, Nicolae Ceausescu. Most of the churches were ignored by the communist government because they were made up of just a few elderly people. And the perception was that the church was dying out in this country. But this church had been reaching university students and it was alive and 
it became a threat to the military police and the word was passed to the highest levels that we want to stomp out this enthusiasm. They began by sending soldiers of the secret police to the doors when people entered the sanctuary, offering threats. Then they began to pick people off and interrogate them and tell them they didn't want them to be a part of, of this church. Eventually they began to persecute Laszlo Tokus, the pastor, and they told him that not only would he be tortured and interrogated, but he would be taken away and killed. Many friends told him that he needed to leave the city, that he needed to flee to exile. But as he prayed about it, he believed that God wanted him with his people. And he believed that in this moment, when his brothers and sisters in Christ needed him the most, that fleeing for his own safety would be disobedient to God's call in his life. So he told the church that he was going to stay. The government leaders came, they took away his ration book trying to starve him. They said that we're going to uh, do the same thing with your congregation. But they, in solidarity, rallied. Some of these young members said, let's have a prayer vigil. They gathered around the church and they said, we're not gonna let the secret police get in to take him away. The expectation is they were coming that night and one young man <clears throat> brought some candles and he said, let's light these candles so that this government knows that we are solid behind this leader and so that they can see our faces and know that it's Romanians that they're torturing. It's Romanians that they're persecuting. Have you ever been in a situation like that? Where you felt you were against all odds? When everything in you and everyone around you told you you need to run? Except for a voice. A voice in your heart. The Spirit's voice that said, stand firm and obey. That's the call that we have in this passage to be disciples. We're called to watch and we're called to be faithful. At times when everything around us tells us to tuck tail and run. Where do we find the courage to stand against opposition? Where do we find the encouragement when even our heart says, I've tried to believe. I tried to trust. Where do we find the strength? We find it in the Savior's heart. We're gonna look this morning at the call to be a fellowship of the burning heart. We're also gonna look at how Jesus delivers us from a dull heart. And in obedience and understanding of what the Savior's done for us, we can stay motivated living in light of his heart. You'll see in your outline, I mentioned two verses. We're back in the book of Luke. Just briefly, let me summarize where we've been. In Luke chapter one through eight, Luke is documenting for us the calling of a new Israel, the calling of the people of God. You could call it the fellowship of the unworthy, strangers, outcasts, artists and thieves, misfits and legends, lost refugees. Now that's not the Gospel of Luke, that's actually Drew and Ellie Holcomb, but it's an apt description of what we see in Luke 1 through 8. As you look around, if you're a guest, you might think, this is a group of people that look like they have it all together. We know that we're misfits, outcasts, artists, thieves, we know that we're strangers and legends and lost refugees, but Jesus has brought us into his family. Victims and villains. Jesus has brought us into his family, the overworked and the overindulgent. Jesus has brought us into his family, the prideful and the fearful. It's the fellowship of the unworthy. But in chapter nine, something shifts in Luke's gospel. 
from 9 to 19, it's often called the journey to Jerusalem, we begin to see the family from the inside out. And Jesus begins to describe what's going on in the heart of the family, what's going on in the heart of every believer. I think you could entitle this section, The Fellowship of the Burning Heart. It starts in chapter nine, where we see Jesus' cross, but he tells us, I'm giving you a cross. And he tells us, deny yourself, take up your cross, O disciples of the burning heart. Then in chapter 10, he's speaking to Martha and to Mary. And he says, don't misunderstand that the heart of Christianity is not productivity. The heart of Christianity is devotion, devotion to me. And really only a few things are necessary, sitting at my feet and growing and understanding my heart. Then chapter 11 begins. We preach four sermons on prayer. The importance of learning to listen to the Father's voice, to align our lives with what God is doing in the world. And then he confronts legalism, that dim light that will deceive us, that will distort us. And then he confronts materialism in the rich young ruler that will deceive us and distort us. Now we find this call to judgment. And I want you to think about God's call to judgment, not something that you're fearful of as a Christian. I'll say it this way. If you're a believer, God's call to judgment is always to correct us that we might know his love in a deeper way. If you're not a believer, God's call to judgment is a condemnation. It says that we are condemned already, John 3 says, because we have rejected God's loving provision in Jesus Christ. But notice I mentioned two verses I think it bookends what we'll be studying today all the way through Luke chapter 24. Luke 11, it says the eye of the lamp, excuse me, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is clear, your whole body shall be full of light. But if your eye is dim, your whole body should be full of darkness. Watch yourselves that the light that is in you is not darkness. So what we see here is Jesus talking about those that are his followers are full of light and heart for him. But he warns, watch the following of dim lights, the dullness of your heart. But then in Luke chapter 24, at the after the resurrection, Jesus is on the road to Emmaus. And two disciples find him and begin a conversation. He serves a meal and he explains the scriptures to them. After he's gone, remember what they said to themselves. Did not our hearts burn within us as he explained the scriptures to us? Luke 11 says, don't go after dim lights. Dim lights will lead to dull hearts. But follow his heart, the Savior's heart, and your heart will stay burning with fire and flame. It's really a call to live by faith. This text reminds us through watchfulness and faithfulness, we're called to live by faith. The first parable speaks of watchfulness and the second parable speaks of faithfulness. I was reading some statistics again from the Pew Research Institute about Americans and belief. It says that 95% of Americans say that they believe in God but what's interesting about those that say that their beliefs have very little effect on their lives, they have two things in common about their beliefs. One thing, those people who say they believe in God but their beliefs have very little effect on their lifestyle, say that they believe that God is not involved in their day-to-day -day affairs or does not have control over what happens to them. The second thing that they say is that they do not believe in a God of judgment or that God is holding them accountable for their actions. 
Interesting, isn't it? People who say that their beliefs have no effect on their life have these things in common. They do not believe that God is in control or has an effect on their everyday life, and they do not believe that God will judge them. Well, that's the exact opposite of what these parables have been written to teach us. We're called to be watchful and we're called to be faithful. That's what it means to live by faith. First, watchfulness. Verses 35 through 40, it says, We are to be dressed and ready. It's literally to have your loins girded up. To be in your work attire is what Jesus says here. He tells these servants, stay ready, stay watchful, be in your work attire. He also says, keep your lamps burning. He's telling them to work through the night, but he's also telling them that the master who's gone away probably to receive a bride, and he's gone away to bring that bride back, he wants things in order when he returns. And he says, keep your lamps burning. That's a sign that you're watching. But then verse 36 says, be looking for my return. When I open the door, I want you to be there looking. I want you to be watchful. The word alert is a word that is used throughout the New Testament. And it's a reminder that living by faith requires us to be watchful. It's a characteristic of the burning heart. Think of 2 Corinthians 4, verse 18. It says that we look not at what is seen, but what is unseen. For that which is seen is temporary, but that which is unseen is eternal. Listen to 1 Peter 5, 8. Be alert, be on your guard. Your adversary, the devil, is like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, you who are strong in your faith, you who are alert. And then listen to Colossians 4. Devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. So a disciple is called to watchfulness. But we're also called to faithfulness. You see that in verses 42 through 48. That's speaking of a stewardship. God challenges us with the dignity of responsibility. He really honors us by saying that you're participating in the work that I'm doing and we're called to steward everything that we own. Our relationships, we're called to steward our free time, we're called to steward our finances. As I mentioned, uh, the, the parable of the rich fool, he was judged because he thought that he owned what was given under his control. Instead of the recognition, everything that we have, everything that we are, everything that we do belongs to him. Paul says it this way, you are not your own. You have been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. We're to be watchful, alert. We're to be faithful, obedient in wise stewardship. But it's such a picture of gospel ministry here and you could miss it because there's a twist in the story, in the parable. You could easily miss it. Look in verse 37 and verse 38. It says, truly I tell you, when I come, the master himself will dress himself to serve. He will have them recline at the table and he will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready even if he comes in the middle of the night. It's amazing, a picture of gospel ministry here. He's saying, be watchful, be alert, because I'm coming to deliver you. This picture of a master serving his servants would be unheard of in the uh, ancient times. It would never happen, never happen among Jews would never happen among in the Greco-Roman Empire. Jesus is saying, be watchful and be alert to experience my deliverance on your behalf. It's a beautiful picture of gospel ministry. J. Edwin Orr, who's written about revivals 
and he's a theologian who studied revivals, was asked once about what is your strategy for growing and understanding the advance of revivals? What would you encourage the church to consider? He said, well, this is the strategy. Find out where the Holy Spirit is working. Show up and be available. Strategy for revival. If anything of spiritual value is going to be done, be watchful in prayer. Be faithful in obedience and watch God work as he begins to reveal the kingdom in our midst. That's what it means to live by faith. I said that last week, but I want to reiterate that again. Our call is to live by faith. And living by faith means this. Jesus' promises are so real to us. Jesus' promises are, are so personal that we live as if a future reality is already true. Or we live as if a future reality is on the way to becoming true because we live by faith. I also reminded us last week, Jesus will disturb us in places where we're unnecessarily comfortable because he wants us to be watchful and he wants us to be alert. But Jesus always will comfort us where we're unnecessarily disturbed and where we need the comfort of the gospel. You need to follow bright lights, not dim lights. How do you keep your heart from becoming dull? You follow the light of the gospel, but also you not only live by faith, but you develop a lifestyle of repentance. Now next week we're going to look more deeply on what it means to develop a lifestyle of repentance. But I want you to just see from this text the need for repentance. Living by faith says, God, I hope in you and I trust in you. Living a lifestyle of repentance says, God, will you change me and transform me? By faith, I trust and hope in you. A lifestyle of repentance says, God, will you change me and transform you? And as I already mentioned, for the believer, he will always come with correctional love, but never in condemnation, always in correctional love. Well, how do we repent. He says first we need to have a pattern of self-examination. Verse 41, Peter, it's almost a humorous question. He asks this question that a lot of us ask, Lord, is this message that you're giving for us, the home team, or is this for those outsiders? Is this for someone else? But I'm glad Peter asked the question. Part of the way that we live a lifestyle of repentance and avoid a dull heart is we're willing to do self-examination. We're willing to ask, in what way is this gospel message meant for me? What's God trying to say to me? The first sign of a dull heart, listening to a sermon, is the person who's thinking of all the people that need to hear this. It's the person who's thinking, when's he gonna be through talking about this? That's a sign of a dull heart. The sign of a burning heart says, how is God speaking to me? In what way do I need to examine my heart? So it starts with self-examination, but it also includes avoiding rationalization. You see that in verse 45. These in the parable say, my master is taking a long time. Well, let me ask you this. What does how long something is take, taking have any effect on the assignment you've been given? If we've been given an assignment, we're to stay at our post. Not until we see some progress or not until we have no strength, we stay until he delivers us. We stay faithful or our hearts are gonna become dull. This is really a call to accountability. It's being willing to be accountable for your actions, for your words, and for your thoughts. And oftentimes, to do this kind of self-examination and to avoid rationalization, you need to do this in community. 
We're going to talk more about that next week, but I'll tell you, it's very difficult to keep your heart burning for God by yourself. Hebrews says it this way. It says, spur one another on, sharpen one another to love and good deeds. Proverbs says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. So part of keeping our hearts on fire for him is we need accountability. Gordon MacDonald, one time was president of InterVarsity and later pastor of uh, Grace Chapel there in Boston. He's probably one of the early celebrity pastors. He talks about his lack of accountability as a pastor and about places where his heart became dull and he didn't even know it. And that's one of the things I'm thankful for, for our elders here. They hold our pastors accountable. They walk with us. They ask us hard questions. They give us tough feedback. In Gordon McDonald's book, Restoring Your Spiritual Passion, he talks about how to turn a dull heart back into a fervent heart. The sad story is that Gordon McDonald had an affair with a woman that he was counseling, lost his ministry platform, and was removed from leadership. When he talked about how his heart became dull, he said it started with a lack of accountability. He said, first it was the drain condition. I was experiencing a strong sense of self-doubt, but I had so much to do and so many people that were dependent on me. Then it was the dried out condition. I was running on empty, going through the motions, but heartless, no real heart motivation. Next came the distorted condition, where I began to think improperly, giving myself a pass and excuses. Obviously, in devastation, I found myself in the despairing condition where I wondered, how could I look at my wife ever again with respect? How would I ever overcome the shame that I have brought on not only these families, but my friends? It was devastation. Well, how does that happen? It happens when dull hearts began to excuse their condition. Next week we'll talk more specifically about living in a lifestyle of repentance. But the beautiful message here is that the Savior's heart has come to deliver us from dull hearts. You see that in verses 49 and 50. The Savior's heart is at war to deliver you. The Savior's heart was warring long before the foundations of the world. Verse 49, Jesus says, I came to set the world on fire. Some people say that he's talking about the persecution of the church and the judgment that will follow. Others say that he's talking about his mission, how he's come uh, to save, come with his passionate heart. I think it's both things. You need to know this. You were fought for before the foundation of the world. Jesus came to the earth, as we said in the Nicene Creed, as divine deliverer, but also as man in his, in his humanity. And he would kindle a fire on this earth to save our souls. But also he knew that he was facing the wrath of God for us. And it says that he was in anguish. He knew that he was going to face the cup of wrath. The Bible talks often about drinking the cup of wrath. And when Jesus prayed, let this cup pass from me, he was in anguish. But he was in anguish because of his love for you and for me. He wanted to rescue us from the domain of the evil one who is destroying our lives and deliver us in the gospel to his heart of love. Last week we talked about those five different scenes that the Gospels record about Jesus in the temple. But scene number five, Jesus' physical presence wasn't even there. He was on the cross, Golgotha, probably within eye shot of that temple. And when Jesus said, it is finished, the veil of the temple tore in half. 
That veil was 60 feet wide, excuse me, yeah, 60 feet wide and 30 feet high. It took 300 priests to move it, it was so thick. And at that one action, that veil was torn. When he said, it is finished, he said, I have absorbed all of God's wrath on your behalf so that you might experience all of God's love from me. We can be judged today and live because the veil is torn, because there's blood on the mercy seat, because Jesus in the fire of God's wrath has consumed all of God's displeasure for those that belong to Christ. God's love is never ending. He is a God of holiness and love, but he's a God of deliverance. That love will shape our hearts into watchful and faithful people. But he's gonna call us to trust him. He's gonna call us to trust him beyond places that we would find ourselves comfortable. Some of you have heard me share this. I'll just briefly remind others of the reality that after I came to know the Lord and decided that I was going on staff with what became a Christian ministry called Campus Outreach. At the time, it was just a few of us in that little startup. We didn't even have a name. It was, we just called ourselves Discipleship. And uh, my dad was a director, a corporate director of a uh, data processing center for a major aircraft company. You might say life to him was ones and zeros. Everything was black and white and real clear. And I remember having to tell him that I was gonna go on staff with his Christian ministry and not take the job that he expected me to take and not to work in business as my brother had worked in business. So I began to stumble around my words and I told him that I was going on staff with this ministry. He said, well, what's the name of the ministry? Well, we don't have a name, you know. So his second question is, well, how much are you gonna make? What's your salary? So I tried to think about how to explain support raising to him in terms that he might could understand. And well, how about insurance benefits? Well, I knew we didn't have insurance benefits. We didn't have a name at the time. And uh, so he said, what are your plans for paying for your kid's college? That was the next question. Now, I wasn't even married at the time and I was just graduating from college. But you can see the ones and the zeros and the sequential thinking. He played it out and he said, I see what you're gonna get on that road and where this road's gonna take you. And all on the way, you're gonna find a barrier without an answer and you're not gonna be prepared. What is your plan? Well, I sat quiet for a second and then I said, I plan to trust God. Well, there was silence after that. It was, in one sense, it was as if I was speaking Mandarin Chinese. You know, Jesus says that there's going to be a division. Even within families, there's going to be a division. My heart was so on fire with the things of God. I wanted to do God's will more than anything else. It's going to call you to trust Him. It's going to call you to step out beyond your comfort. It may cause division in your family. I will tell you that I've prayed for my family for 30 years. I've prayed for my brother, I've prayed for my sister, I've prayed for my parents. I pray for my children and I pray, may they never curse the name that I love so dearly. Will you be merciful to draw them to yourself? And it's beautiful over 30 years how God has drawn my brother and my sister and my mother and my father to the fellowship of the burning heart to be a part of his great love and deliverance. He calls us to live by faith. What are you trusting God for right now in your life? What things has God made you disturbed about in those places where you've become comfortable? Where do you need to find his comfort in living by faith? Let's conclude that little church in Romania. They gathered around the church. They had their candles. They expected the secret police to come, but the police didn't come. The next night, a few more gathered. They invited friends and family, and they expected some kind of confrontation. Nobody came. 
One of the elders began to call friends in other churches. They called the Baptists. They called the Moravians. They called the Lutherans. They called the Orthodox. They called the Catholics. And what happened the next night surprised everybody. Thousands of people showed up in, in, uh, around that church. Thousands of people with their candles saying that they would not allow, allow this pastor to be taken either and that the government needed to change. Night after night, prayer vigils took place in this city. They sang the national hymns of, the, of Romania. They sang Christian hymns that had never been sung in public for 50 years. The government had had enough. On December 19th, they sent in the army and they began to just mow people down. They killed hundreds, thousands were wounded. But it didn't stop the protest. The next night, people gathered again. The world began to see the evil of that dictatorship. And by December 25th, Nikolai Ceausescu had been removed from power. One young man who was injured was in the hospital. His name was Daniel Garva. The pastors went to visit Daniel, this young university student. Before they went into the room, they prayed and they felt somewhat sick at their stomach. In the battle, Daniel had been shot in the leg and in order to save his life, his leg had been amputated. So they prayed and they prepared themselves knowing that they needed to go in and comfort him. As the pastors moved in, they found a joyful and bright Daniel greeting them. They said, Pastor, it's so great to see you. I hear that the government has been overthrown. God has heard our prayers. He was so enthusiastic. And as they talked to them, well, how are you feeling about the loss of your leg? How are you feeling about its effect on you? He said, no, pastor, don't worry about me. I will always remember I lit the first candle. I brought the first candle. I was watchful and faithful when everything around us said tuck tail and run. That's the fellowship of the burning heart. That's the call that Jesus gives all of us. That's the power of the Savior. Let's pray. Lord, may we be people who believe that a future reality is so real and true to us that we live by faith. We live as if that reality is already true because we know it is true. Father, if there's anyone here that doesn't know the saving love of Christ, deliver, us, deliver them from the judgment to come. Deliver them to the hope of eternal life, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
want you to raise your hands to receive God's benediction. Believer in Christ, Christ is coming. Go in the assurance that everyone who fixes his hope on Christ's return purifies himself even as Christ is pure. Go in that peace. Amen.